General Alumni Association. And this afternoon, we have the privilege of having Buck Goldstein here with us, who's going to talk through um, a little bit of why am I here and his own journey and hopefully leave us with some wonderful tidbits. Um, we are recording this today, and so we do expect that we will have a recording available in a few days. Um, and so if you need to hop or leave um, right at one o'clock, that's fine. You'll be able to check out the recording later. So thank you so much and thank you to all of our GAA members for your membership. Um, it is your dues that make events like this possible. And you did not come to hear me, so I'm gonna turn it over to Buck. Thank you, Marcy. So we're, we're just uh, finalizing a few little technical matters, but I think we're good to go. And I want to thank the Alumni Association for inviting me today, especially um, to Marcy and her crew for making this all work and making it possible, and to Doug and, of course, Debbie, because they're a team, for all they do at the Alumni Association. Uh, most of it unsung, but for many, many, many years, they have uh, been the glue that has made this place exceptional. And uh, I just want to recognize both of them for their hard, hard work. So let me begin by with a disclaimer. Uh, this is not going to be a big advice thing. I'm not really big on advice because honestly, I think um, everybody's different. And uh, it's unlikely that anything that I could tell you is going to be the right answer for you. So then rather today, rather than giving you a bunch of right answers, I'm going to try to suggest some questions. And uh, hopefully the questions, uh, if they're useful to you, will lead you to on your own journey and help you reach some of your own conclusions. I mean, obviously, we've all been through a lot over the last few years, and many of us are have asked the question, why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And I thought that by going through my own journey and some things that I've learned that maybe that, that will be helpful in um, helping you answer the question, why am I here? And I will promise you that uh, not too much advice. Um, I learned a long time ago from my own kids that uh, offering advice uh, is really not the right way to go. And I think if you ask them, they'd probably come up with maybe one thing. Um, it would probably be the same thing that, I, uh, that I've ever told them about advice. So we'll stick with why am I here and talk about my journey and then some lessons learned that I've learned and maybe they'll be helpful to you as well. So um, uh, it became clear to me as we, uh, as I started thinking about why am I here that I'm a lucky person. Um, this, this is a picture of the neighborhood I grew up in. Um, it's in Miami, Florida, and uh, uh, I was very fortunate to have a lot of advantages growing up. I described it to um, a group of grad students who I helped teach um, and said that, you know, I think I'm just a lucky person. And one grad student said, oh, luck is what privileged people call privilege. Luck is what privileged people call privilege. So I guess I was a privileged person, and that's probably a better term. And um, I think all of us need to acknowledge that. It's taken me a long time to come to grips with this, and I can promise you it was only digging deep that I agree, got comfortable in my own mind to show this picture, but this is where I came from. Um, I think Marcy will testify that I was reluctant to um, even undertake this task uh, because, and I felt so strongly that, gee, I'm not sure I really want to do this because I knew if I did, I'd have to tell 
the whole story, and this is the beginning of the story. Uh, uh, I grew up uh, in Miami. I um, had a lot of advantages growing up, and uh, um, it stood me in good stead. Um, another advantage uh, was getting to come to Chapel Hill. And although I grew up in a middle-class family with uh, uh, knowledge about universities, my parents had been to college, et cetera, I really didn't know what a university was all about. And I really wanted to come to Chapel Hill and, and initially I didn't get in. And here's another example of luck or maybe calling it something else. But I had a cousin who was here and he went by one day and talked to the director of admissions and the director of admissions said, if he's, uh, I know he didn't get in, but if he still wants to come, tell him he can come. So I guess that's another reason I'm here. Uh, and uh, I um, am extraordinarily grateful to that cousin who I see from time to time. And every time I see him, I thank him because it wouldn't have been, uh, my life would have been dramatically different if I hadn't had the opportunity to, to land here as a freshman and to begin to see a whole world that um, I had no knowledge really existed. So rather than going through the whole four years of uh, undergraduate, et cetera, um, I want to tell you one story that I think illustrates what really changed me about um, my own trajectory and about um, my life going forward. Um, and that was this. And some of you who've tuned in may have been here when this actually happened, but as uh, I was a child of the late 60s. We were in the midst of a war in Vietnam. Um, our classmates, uh, and in some cases their parents, were going to Vietnam. And in some cases, uh, we lost classmates and our classmates lost parents at Vietnam, in Vietnam. And um, at some point, uh, students actually, led by some very savvy students and politicians um, came together and determined that enough was enough and that we really needed to get out. And there didn't seem to be any real prospect for doing that. So something called the moratorium against the war in Vietnam was uh, proposed. And here on Chapel Hill, about 25 people got together in Gerard Hall. And honestly, uh, I was asked to be the informal leader of this. And I've racked my brain and I have no idea why or how that actually happened. Um, but in any event, um, I guess I was the chair person for 25 people in Gerard Hall as we talked about how we on October 15th were going to, on our campus, participate in a nationwide protest against the war in Vietnam. And um, from there, things just um, snowballed way beyond anyone's expectations. We thought we'd get 100, maybe 200 people, maybe 300. Then we thought maybe 500. Um, and as you can see from the Daily Tar Heel, 7,000 people participated in this march that began in Memorial Hall and marched around up and down Franklin Street and then back to Memorial Hall. And when the last people were leaving Memorial Hall to make this trek around the campus, the first people were, were arriving again. It was that big. And it was really almost incomprehensible because um, it was bigger than any person or even small group of people. And although it didn't, 
immediately in the war in Vietnam. It caused a president to decide not to run again. And it began a process that ultimately led to a withdrawal in Vietnam and hopefully saved some lives in the process. You can see a, on the left of the screen, a UNC lecturer defies trustees who said that classes had to meet and said his class was, wasn't gonna meet. Um, most faculty simply uh, turned their, the, their eyes in a different direction uh, on the day that students uh, boycotted the classroom and marched against the war. What was so profound for me about this was the, I, the experience of having an idea that was so much bigger than um, any of us could have imagined and the power of that idea because at the end of the day um, at the request his request we met every evening with the president of the university to discuss plans for the moratorium and what was going to happen it, and this was not faculty that were saying we should do this or how we should do it. This was students essentially leading the faculty and leading the university. And it was turning everything on its head, essentially, because the idea itself and the belief in that idea was so much bigger than any person or any one person. And the power of it was so much more powerful than any of us could have imagined. So going through that experience was transformational. Um, and at the same time, having uh, friends and allies and contacts like Ann Queen, who's in the picture next to me at the very front of that march, uh, who was a remarkable woman from a small town in North Carolina uh, and went from there to the uh, working at the Champion Paper Mill and from there to Berea College and then ultimately Yale Divinity School and then heading the campus Y. And it was scores of people like that whose paths I crossed and who changed me fundamentally. So that's another um, step along the way in terms of why am I here. There were some others. Uh, there's another UNC experience. This is an experience of cutting the ribbon at Hyde Hall in uh, where the Institute for the Arts and Humanities is housed on the campus of UNC. And in the middle is a professor uh, named Rule Tyson, who influenced uh, generations of UNC students. And what was so amazing about this and why it was so transformational was it began as a brown bag lunch in a tiny little um, uh, almost cabin on the UNC campus called West House, which has now been torn down, and with a group of faculty saying that there needed to be more support for faculty and we needed to find a way to keep our very best faculty here on campus. And uh, Rule was a dreamer, believe, had an idea that was bigger than any one else could imagine. Um, he, frankly, uh, it wasn't like the powers that be were all aligned, but the idea was a big idea. And in the process of, um, of pushing that idea, he turned to some of his students because we were the ones who had organized the moratorium, I think. And th he thought, well, maybe we can help him organize this big idea. And through an incredible set of lucky occurrences, including um, a major donor who said what it helped if to get Hyde Hall built, if we could say that it was paid for, Hyde Hall became a reality. The IAH is now one of the most influential institutions on the UNC campus. It has an endowment over, of over $50 million. And as one chancellor said to me, objectively, the IAH and Hyde Hall are a miracle. They're impossible. It, it can't happen, but it did happen. And so that was another sort of
Okay, so um, I, I saw some faces out there, and one is my wife. I want you to know, okay, this was not my deal. <laughs> She's convinced that I probably uh, screwed up my computer, and I, I didn't. Um, but we are all good. Um, we had a little power failure briefly. So that was West House, and another remarkable um, experience where um, it was objectively impossible and it happened. And it was another case of shaping my path uh, to be part of something that was so much bigger and to see so many people uh, make what was objectively impossible actually work. Um, so I, my path also led me, um, I practiced law uh, and uh, as an unlikely child of the late 60s and uh, um, I became um, founded and started with a partner, um, a company called Information America. Um, and this is a company that uh, had another big idea, which was to put all the courthouse records in the United States online and make them accessible from lawyers' offices instead of having to go down to the courthouse and, and read them. Um, and I can say that uh, all of the lessons I learned before, um, that big ideas could happen, that energizing people around a vision and then uh, supporting them could lead to things that were objectively impossible. Um, came together with Information America. But I also say that um, it was uh, the hardest thing I've ever done. And where things like the IAH and the, um, even the moratorium against the war, we were paddling downstream and the waves were with us and it just seemed almost like magic. Um, starting a company and making it work and eventually helping it to get public was um, just one crisis after the other. And they weren't just problems, it was existential crisis. Were we gonna make it from day to day? Could we make payroll? Could we solve a big problem with the lawsuit? Could we make our system work on days when it looked like it wasn't gonna work? And um, it was harrowing, it was demanding, and um, I really could only do it one time. Uh, so it clearly was not it was as hard as it was, and ultimately we achieved, achieved a lot of objectives, and I learned a lot of lessons. I probably learned most importantly that execution and actually getting it done was uh, on a day-to-day, -day, minute -to minute basis, was also critical. Um, and even when I describe it right now, I have to take a deep breath because it was harrowing and, uh, and tough. Um, I was able, however, to move from that, uh, from that struggle, I would say, to another, struggle where um, I was uh, a venture capitalist for a while. And as my wife Kay said, what venture capitalists uh, have the opportunity to do is do most of their business uh, or their, their work either early in the morning or late at night. So she said, basically, you do business in your underwear. Uh, and that was a lot about what VC was like, and it was equally challenging and difficult. And it was only because of the lessons I'd learned before that uh, I was able to, uh, to get through those uh, experiences and lead me back to Chapel Hill because the, I, the, the experiences themselves, honestly, gave me the financial 
uh, freedom to be able to come back to Chapel Hill to uh, a venue that I understood, an environment and a culture I understood, and and um, be able to um, um, embark upon a new journey in Chapel Hill. So the university got a big grant to from the Kaufman Foundation to make entrepreneurship part of our DNA, not just in the business school or not just in the School of Public Health, but throughout the whole university. And objectively, um, that was going to be a tough lift. Entrepreneurship at the time was a dirty word. Faculty members were not much interested. And um, if you did a, an assessment and said, should I, we move from Atlanta and come back to Chapel Hill and undertake that uh, uh, journey, the cons would way outweigh the pros. Um, but um, I had dinner one night in uh, Carborough. Kay and I were coming from different parts of the country. We met for dinner and one of us said to the other, I think I know the answer to this question, but I can't remember what it is. Why don't we live in Chapel Hill? And uh, it was the opportunity to come back and work with the entrepreneurship program and to get back to live in Chapel Hill that um, created something special. And then the other special thing is that uh, soon after we got back, I met Holden Thorpe, who then I think was chair of the chemistry department, or maybe the was running the Moorhead Planetarium even before he was chair of the chemistry department, and made a lifelong friend and collaborator. And again, we began to do some things that were objectively impossible, which was to, as I mentioned, inject entrepreneurship into the DNA of a established and quite staid university. And over uh, several years, as Holden's ascent, which was steep and fast, uh, took place, and as we continued to collaborate, we were able to establish the Schufert Program in Entrepreneurship, uh, which is, uh, received several years ago the largest grant, $25 million, in the uh, history of the College of uh, in the history of the College of Arts and Sciences, we're able to found a, uh, a course, Econ 125, it was called, that had 420 students a semester and was uh, impactful on many many uh, students, some of whom I hope are logged on today, and we were able to um, write two books. Um, talking about how entrepreneurship needed to be part of the university, but, but the university also had a higher calling, which was uh, at, the, uh, at this moment to rebuild the partnership that universities have with the American public. So again, objectively uh, impossible, um, incredible uh, team of people, assembled to um, make it happen, and uh, another dream actually came true. So um, I, I can't go any further without saying that the one constant uh, through all of this was a remarkable family. Uh, Kay and I were married in the Carolina Inn while just as we graduated. So it's 52 years, and uh, uh, essentially anyone who knows us knows that um, I lucked out uh, that there's always been people around me that were smarter and more able than me, and Kay is the model for all of that. Um, two kids who n never took me very seriously, which was really a good thing, because um, it um, it anchored me and brought me down to earth and 
I understood as a dad that my main job was to be a, a someone that could be made fun of, and I was okay with that, and they were okay with that, and um, have been just remarkable um, companions as all of us continued our journey together. So what are the lessons learned? And I'll be brief so we can have a little time for questions if there are any. And if you have questions, put them in the question box. Um, the first thing is ask hard questions. So even today, um, what I was hoping is that my, um, why am I here might um, cause you to think about yours. And um, that means that the question is really much more important than the answer. So if today has caused you to think about a few questions, I've achieved my objective. Um, and if you do ask the right questions, more often than not, you will get um, an answer. There's more than one right answer, but if you ask the right questions, you will get a right answer, and that's what's really important. So the next, um, the next suggestion I have, and I think the, the stories that I've told you should, um, should illustrate that, is that missions mat the mission matters that people really want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And after a while, it gets a little addictive. You, you get, it's exciting to be a part of something that um, objectively maybe can't happen, but will happen or does happen. And it's incredible to be part of a group of people committed to that. Once that mission is clear, and once people are signed up, then you can go to the moon. You can do all the things that are objectively impossible. And um, from a lifestyle and from a life point of view, there's really nothing, nothing better than to be part of a mission that really matters. And obviously, that's what drew me back to Chapel Hill. It drew me back to being part of a community that was bigger than any one person or bigger than, than in many ways, um, any group of people. It was a mission that's been in existence longer than any other public university. And it's a mission that, as I said, really matters. It takes a village. And uh, this isn't a political statement. Uh, this is just a fact that Anything that's important and that's really worth doing um, takes more than an individual or even a small group of individuals. It takes a village. And the folks who figure this out early and who are able to look in the mirror and understand the things that maybe they do well and also the things that they don't do well are the ones who understand that you assemble teams that when you go after a problem you don't begin with what's the solution or even the, what's the right question it's what's the team that we need to put together because they're going to help with what's the right question and then ultimately come up with some answers and actually be able to help implement um, whatever the the objective or whatever the project is. So um, my own family helped me realize and he helps me realize that we had a little village and that village has um, then blossomed into a whole series of villages of people who were committed together to a vision, uh, something bigger than themselves. And that's what um, it takes. Uh, to do something important. And lastly, um, and this is really important, 
This is another lesson that I learned that you can reorganize things, you can cut corner, uh, cut expenses, you can uh, um, introduce new products, you can introduce new uh, curricula. But at the bottom line, it's about culture. And culture is what breeds uh, big ideas. A place where it, an environment where that embraces big ideas, that embraces uh, people and their aspirations. Um, and culture doesn't get created by somebody giving a speech. It's actions every single day. At Information America, um, I started something when there were about 15 employees and wrote a Christmas card, um, a handwritten note to every employee around Christmas with a personal um, uh, message uh, because I knew them all and I knew them well. And um, that tradition continued throughout the entire time in Information America to a time when there were several hundred employees. And yet the Christmas card became so important that we'd start, I'd start in October and when I was flying around on airplanes, writing Christmas cards um, and getting help uh, because I didn't necessarily have uh, the right words for every single employee. And then when we, when I run into folks, uh, even now, people talk about the Christmas card. And that's an example of how you build culture. Um, and the, you need a culture that's accessible and transparent and authentic and that people can trust. And I know when, um, when Holden was chancellor and I was interviewing some people for one of our books, uh, they told me, you know, I don't really need to call Holden, and I don't know that I ever have, but I need to know that I can, and that if I do, that he'll um, take my call and that he'll transparently give me a clear answer. And that was really, and is, I think, an incredible uh, example of the kind of leadership that um, creates a culture. And, the, and culture is created in many ways from the top and then encouraged. It's a, it's a culture where people, um, where leaders of a university are um, also teaching classes. And our own chancellor and I teach a class together because Kevin Gussowitz believes you can't really be a good chancellor if you're not teaching students. If you're not in the classroom um, doing the work that is so essential to what we do. And guess what? If the chancellor teaches a class, then almost everybody else does too. And that's about a culture and not just a structure. So this is an advice. This is what I've learned. Uh, I hope that there'll be some things about what, uh, from this that will cause you to ask the right questions for you and to come up with some, um, some answers that may help you re-answer the question, why am I here? I'd also say that it's clear to me, having uh, done this and done it also in a class, that we should all do this about once a year. We should all ask ourselves the question, why am I here about once a year, and push ourselves uh, into realms and into um, experiences that maybe aren't comfortable, but uh, help us more persuasively uh, answer the question um, on an ongoing basis. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Are there any questions in the chat? I'm Marcy? not seeing any yet. Oh, here's one. Okay. How do you handle disappointments, confusion, and maybe feeling lost? while continuing this contemplative inquiry? Well, uh, I can um, let you answer that because um, I think I qualify at this moment for all three of those. <laughs> so um, um, 
some one of my kids might say, well, you fake it till you make it. But basically, you, could, you do have to put your head down and you have to take a deep breath and do the day to day things that are required. But give yourself some space. And I would say give yourself permission and to even embrace the confusion and the and the uncertainty um, and try to turn it into some into a positive but with the understanding that you're not alone that um, it's hard uh, but that there are uh, there's um, there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, really important um, lessons that can be learned from the adversity. We've all been through more adversity probably than we can imagine. And uh, we're all here and we're all still standing. And, you know, uh, it was hard to do, frankly, as Marcy will tell you, I didn't want to do this. And, th <laughs> and that was hard as well because I still feel confused and unsure about why am I here. Um, but uh, I think take a stab and keep going. How do you handle um, addressing when the culture is not in alignment? Do you depart or do you work to change the culture? It's a great question. And I've asked myself that question many times. Um, frankly, the pandemic uh, caused me to wonder if being here at UNC was exactly what I needed to do. And uh, I went through my own journey and actually had a lunch yesterday with the chancellor to talk about uh, some things that we might do together and work my way through to the fact that I don't know another institution that I think is more meaningful than a university. We need universities more than ever. and. UNC has his own set of challenges and it needs people like uh, the people who are tuned into this podcast to, to uh, step up. And, um, and if the culture isn't just right, to try to, uh, try to make a change in the culture. But there are times when you do have to leave and um, I respect people who do. There, it's a hard decision. Uh, there's no right answer. It's only what's the right answer for you. But if you ask the question, why am I here? I think it may help you answer the question. Um, is the culture I'm in one that I need to stay in and try to change or one I need to leave? Well, that's okay. um, When you talked about your family being a really mm -hmm. important part of your journey or the village that moved mm -hmm. with you, do you have any advice for people who don't have the, the benefits or the, the luxury of having such a wonderful family? Well, family is a, is a, can be a broad term. Mm -hmm. So family might mean uh, a wife and kids I mean, the sort of uh, father knows best kind of old fashioned family, but increasingly there are all kinds of different definitions of family. Uh, our extended family, and I'm talking about Kay's and mine, actually are classmates of ours from UNC and we see them all every year. We saw them this summer. We see them in the same place every year. And they are our extended family. They're our children's extended family. They're like aunts and uncles to our kids. And so I think what's important is people that are close to you, that care about you, and that will tell you the truth. Uh, that won't and have nothing to gain from uh, the relationship other than caring about you and you caring about them. And I can't say how important I think that is. It takes time, it takes cultivation, it takes empathy. And I many, many times have not been as good at it as I would like to. I've been much more too, much more goal oriented, not enough people oriented. 
but I understand and I think that it did, um, how important it is. So define family broadly and then build one, one way or the other. Um, you spend a lot of time working with students and their big ideas through entrepreneurship. I'm curious if you could share more about any advice you have for adults who feel like they are further in life than 20 and maybe not as idealistic or optimistic about right. taking big ideas. If you're not optimistic, don't be an entrepreneur. I mean, you <laughs> have to be um, certifiably nuts uh, to take on one of these big ideas because they're objectively impossible. So um, knowing yourself, I think is what's really important. I mean, I am um, a, a optimist, uh, unreal, I'm an unrealistic optimist. And so I know that I need to have people around me who are a little bit more realistic, but, um, um, and who can tell me when something's not going to work, but uh, other people are more realistic and maybe different paths uh, make sense for them. Um, I think that entrepreneurs mostly are involuntary entre entrepreneurs, either because life has forced them to be one, because the comfortable place they were in is no longer there, and they've got to figure it out, or because um, something in their DNA just requires them to live on the edge. Um, so I don't think it's for everybody. I think what's I think asking why am I here is for everyone, but starting a business or starting something new is not for everyone. And I think that's if you do it, it's because you have the need or the one way or the other to do it, but it's not to be taken lightly. And I would say that um, it the starting of an entrepreneurial business was um, I still uh, have uh, wake up with nightmares about that. It was really, really, really hard. And uh, I don't recommend it for everyone. Um, but if you have a vision and if you have or a, a dream, you should jump on it um, if that's what's if you if that's the right thing for you, um, sometimes there are ways to hedge your bets where you can keep your day job and begin to test your um, the, your vision or your night job. But again, I think it comes. I think why am I here is the right first question. And if you answer by saying I've got to do this because otherwise I don't have a good answer for why am I here, then by all means give it a whirl. We have about four minutes to one o'clock. We will continue taking questions, especially given our technology problems. But just a reminder, we're recording this. So if you have a hard stop at one, um, you can always grab the recording later. Um, the next question is, what's on your bucket list now that, that you have yet to check off? I don't have a bucket list. Um, I know a lot of people have a bucket list. Um, and. I, I think in large part it's because in I've really never had a plan. Um, I've been, you know, lucky or privileged, uh, and um, opportunity has come um, our way, case in my way, in all kinds of different ways. But it wasn't like uh, I'll give you an example. Many many years ago. We met a man who helped finance Information America from Scotland, and he um, pioneered a whole set of enterprises on the Isle of Skye. And um, he always asked us to come visit on the Isle of Skye. Well, he unfortunately has passed away. His widow has continued his legacy on the Isle of Skye. And the other day, Kay and I said, you know, we never, uh, we never uh, satisfied our promise to, to Ian 
to visit the Isle of Skye, we should do that. So I sent an email, which I hope has gotten through, it's only a few days old, to his widow who lives on Skye to say that we want to come to the Isle of Skye and when would be a good time to do that. So that, I wouldn't call that a bucket list. I think that was an opportunity. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that that will work out in a really exciting way. Um, but um, we don't, I don't have a, gee, I want to check this off. I want to check that off. Um, I think we'll have a little bit more time to, um, to do some things that are fun. Um, but the other maybe curse is that what, for so long I've been doing things that were fun that there really isn't a line between um, work and fun. And maybe that's something I didn't realize. And maybe that's something as you ask yourself, why am I here to aspire to is that what you're doing, you love what you're doing and it's a lot of fun. And so um, you don't have to have a whole bunch of things that you're aspiring to out in the future because what you love what you're doing. Um, how do you handle cynics? Mm. Or relate with cynics? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I try to listen. Uh, and that's the importance of listening because Honestly, um, sometimes there's some real truth in, in the cynicism. And so um, it can be a bummer sometimes or a real downer. But um, on the other hand, cynics can be, another word can be realists. And that's where it takes a village. You need some cynics uh, as part of the village to balance off people like me that are overly optimistic. And so I would embrace the cynic, listen to what they say, and because there's probably some real truth in, in, their, in their point of view. You mentioned how your business was very laborious and stressful. What kept you motivated to keep going? Um, survival. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to say that something else, but um, this entrepreneurship thing, especially in the private sector, commercial entrepreneurship, your, your enterprise is at risk almost every day. Um, and if you think, gee, if I can just get up over this mountain, I'll, uh, I can take a rest. It never works that way. Climbing a mountain just gives you a chance to climb the next one. And it's not like you can de take a deep breath. Uh, it just keeps coming at you. It's sort of like being a um, chancellor of a university is uh, uh, a similar position where it just keeps coming at you and you're just trying to hold things together and keep moving forward and keep people motivated and knowing that everybody's looking at you when you walk in in the morning to when you leave at night and uh, you're just trying to, to get it done, make it through the day. Um, and it's, that's not uh, the part of my life, I would say that was, uh, when I say you're having fun, um, that wasn't fun. <laughs> That really wasn't fun. Um, and that's why I ended up back here in Chapel Hill because one was enough. And people kept saying, what's your next business gonna be? And I said, there isn't gonna be a next business. And uh, after we finished our second book, cause that writing a book was hard too. It, Holden said, well, what's, what, what, are we gonna, what book are we gonna do? And I said, no, what book are you gonna do? Because um, that's enough too, two books was enough. So there are challenges like that. Uh, when you're in the middle of them, you lose yourself sort of, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, know yourself and know what you've got in you and um, um, know that it's gonna be really hard sometimes. Um, 
Grit is very important and underrated. The willingness to just get up off the floor, uh, get up, uh, deal with the failure and get up off the floor and come to work the next day. I think that is very timely for the question that just popped in the chat, which is how do you handle the mental health challenges of starting and running a business? Uh, you, you all are asking great questions. Um, so I think maybe um, I had the either good fortune or bad fortune, frankly, of being somewhat oblivious and I know my wife is going to nod, is nodding right now. To some of the mental health challenges that I faced, I just um, was in denial. Um, and as I have a had a little bit more time and have a little bit more maybe perspective, um, I can um, come to grips with them. But I'm probably just lucky or privileged that I got through it because I know that if I embraced some of them and really thought about them, uh, it would have, I would have had a hard time doing what I was doing every day. Um, different people. So again, it's different for different people. And fortunately for all of us, I think most people um, aren't, either able or willing to be in that kind of denial. And I'm not advocating it and I don't want to do it again. But I think um, the answer is for me was um, that I just uh, was oblivious to them uh, until much later. Um, I didn't want, you had two comments. One is from a 2010 grad, minored in entrepreneurship and just wanted to say that she attributed her career path to you and Mrs. Grumbles and others and just wanted to thank you. You Can you say who? Uh, her name is Megan Sharp. Oh, Megan. Um, thank you very much. And then also from Felice Weiner, who says, greetings from an old classmate. Retirement has its own challenges and pleasures. Wonderful. Hi, Felice. And thanks for tuning in. And thanks. Um, to all of you for coming uh, for this period of time. I think what you did was you made me do something I didn't want to do, and I'm glad I did. And I've learned something from it. And so now it's your turn. Um, ask the question why you're here, and then go through the difficult process of trying to answer it. Thank you, Buck. And thank all of you for your patience and for joining us today especially to our GAA members, but of course, all of our alumni. Um, we wish you a wonderful afternoon and stay tuned to your emails um, because we will be sending out information about when the recording is available. I hope you all have a wonderful day and are able to find your alum. Have a great one.